there's approximately a little bit over 1,800 students um, who are in the engineering school. Um, we have at the undergraduate level, um, and that's across all four years, um, and we have 13 different majors. Um, we have uh, nine different departments within the engineering school. Sorry, we got a puppy. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's supposed to be watched by someone else. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, so the, um, one of the things that's kind of unique is that we have more majors than departments. Um, and so all that means is that some majors share a department. Um, so an example I usually give is civil engineering and environmental engineering. It's one department, um, but it's housed in uh, it's two different programs that are housed together. So um, do you guys have any questions just over demographics at this point? And I can all, we always can go back to, um, but I just want to kind of give you a sense as far as size-wise where we're at. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, one of the things I also like to just kind of mention is uh, we are very lucky. We have one of the oldest co-op programs in the United States. Um, and co-op is just an opportunity for engineering students to gain an industry experience while you're still at the undergraduate level. It's completely voluntary, um, so you don't have to do it. There are some engineering programs that you probably have found that it is required with engineering, um, but for us it's optional. Approximately about 20% of our students choose to participate in a co-op program. Um, co-op uh, at Northwestern, how it's designed is that uh, we have a little bit over uh, 500 different employers across the United States um, that are considered active. To be an active employer, all it means is that an engineering student um, over the past five years has done an experience, has worked for that particular company. Um, the program is actually designed so that if you did the full rotation, you'd actually graduate with 18 months of work experience under your belt um, prior to receiving your undergraduate engineering degree. It's a rotational program, so the first rotation is the summer after your sophomore year. So what's kind of good about that is that you have two full years of education under your belt before you go out to industry. Um, so what you can actually achieve on that position is, or in that job is actually rather significant as far as experience goes. All of our work terms, all of our experiences are, are paid experiences. Um, if you have, and also too, we do the first rotation over the summer. So if you decide, you know what, this isn't a good fit for me, I don't want to do co-op, that's no problem. You can withdraw from the program. There's no penalty for doing that. And you've also, um, because you did that experience over your summer break, you've not disrupted your academic schedule. Um, if you did decide to stay in the program, then it's a rotational pattern. So you'd be rotating a work experience with um, coming back to campus and taking classes. And that's going to happen on the calendar year. Um, so what it, it could do if you do the full 18 months, if you don't have any, um, if you didn't come in with any advanced credit um, or AP credit or IB credit, um, then you're here for five years on the calendar year. You're only taking classes for 12 quarters, the same as if you were here for four years. It's just that rotational pattern that extends it on the calendar year. Um, you're, the other thing to do is to mention with co-op is that when you're on a work term quarter, you're going to be registered for a non-credit co-op class. That non-credit registration maintains full-time student status even though you're not going to be charged um, tuition on that particular quarter um, because you're actually working. Um, we also, as I mentioned, require all of our employers um, to actually uh, pay the students when they're on a work term. And so you are, there's no money that actually just hands between the university. There's no registration fee that a company would pay Northwestern to be a part of our program. It's simply if we have a student who is working for that company, um, that student is actually uh, getting, a, um, getting funding from that employer. Um, the reason for that is we want to make sure that all of our students have access to be able to participate in the program. So that's why we don't accept any unpaid experiences for our students. Um, do you guys have any questions about the co-op program? And I know I, oh yeah, go ahead, Sonia. So I was just wondering like how many people, like students on campus actually enroll in the co-op and then how many actually complete the 18 months? Like, oh, great question. So great question. Um, so it's, we have seen, I'll be honest, like we have seen a decrease in co-op participation over the last three years. So, um, and that's, we're seeing that at peer schools too. Um, and I think part of it is just, so historically what happens is when um, the students, when students view the economy as fluctuating, then you see a lot of interest in co-op because what co-op does, it gives you a connection with an employer 
what we do tend to see is co-op students tend to get a full-time offer from their co-op employer. They don't have to take it, and so they do go through the regular, typically, recruiting process. Um, co-op students also tend to have a higher starting salary than students who opt not to do co-op. And the reason for that is your experiences are significant, and that's recognized um, by other employers. Um, the, um, what we've also noticed is that students who do co-op so you usually get an offer from your co-op employer, but then if you go through the recruiting process, that co-op employer's competitor can become very interested with you, especially if you did the full rotation that full 18 months, um, it, because like you've worked for the competition for a year and a half, and that's pretty significant. Um, that you, and that's a different type of experience that you're bringing to the table than some of your peers um, who are just doing internships or using research. Um, but yeah, co-op, honestly, is a, it can be a hard sell to a first-year student, right? Because you come in and the American system is based off of, like, well, college should be four years. And so, you know, if you decide you, we want you to kind of think about joining co-op in that freshman year, um, but you don't have to decide then. You can wait until your sophomore year, but that's not a ton of time to make that decision, and we recognize that. Um, and then we also, what we also recognize is that students don't necessarily want to stay for five years <laughs> at, um, in college. They want to move on, right, to that next phase of your life. Um, and so as a result, we have, oh, two years ago, we adjusted the co-op schedule. So in order to get the certificate of co-op, the completion certificate upon graduation, you only have to have nine months of work experience under your belt instead of the 18 months. So, um, and for some of our students, because they are, they do have some great opportunities and they are coming in with some AP credit or some IB credit, um, they don't necessarily need to be here for their undergraduate degree for 12 quarters of classes. And so they don't necessarily have to, to stay, you know, that, that five year on the calendar year. So they can do an adjusted schedule and maybe finish classes in four years with their co-op and maybe an additional quarter. So um, it's totally up to the students. Now, I do think with the current situation that's going on um, in the United States that um, we are starting to see a little bit more interest in co-op because uh, you know the students are a little bit um, thinking about like kind of long term as far as like you know um, what's the economy going to look like what kind of recruiting opportunities are going to be out there and so I do tend to think that next year um, we probably will see a little bit of, or this year sorry that we will start to see a bump of student interest in co-op um, which is similar to I think what other schools are starting to report so great question though very good question um, are international students allowed to co-op considering F-1 visas? Don't allow students? Yes. So international students can do co-op. It counts for, um, I'm, I'm going to, I want to, I'm blanking on the acronym. It's like continuing education units. Um, CT, they use an acronym for it um, that I can't remember right now. But what I'll do is I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and so if you guys have any questions after we leave today, you can always shoot me an email back and then I'll give me time um, to get the right terminology on that. But like uh, international students can participate in co-op because you're going to be registered for that non-credit um, co-op class when you're on a work term quarter and you're doing this to complement your education. Cool. Any other questions that will give me a chance to, I'm going to put my name um, and info, contact info in the chat, but um, I sometimes have a hard time typing and thinking and writing and talking at the same. So if you, does anyone have a question right now that they would like or? Okay, no problem. Okay, so I just put it in. Um, so uh, the other thing just to kind of mention is that obviously not every student does co-op. So the vast majority of our students will do summer internships in industry or they'll use their summers to do uh, research experience. Um, and so both are very viable options. One of the benefits, I think, in some ways of the difference between a co-op and an internship is that if you use your summers wisely in college, um, that you have opportunities to work for three totally different organizations over the summer, um, whereas co-op's going to be one extended relationship but with one employer. It's very possible in co-op you could go to different sites if the company has different um, uh, like uh, different plants or different facilities. Um, but for internships, 
um, most of the internships too also, because the calendar year is going to look a little different, right? So for internships for our students, they typically only take place over the summer months. So one thing that's kind of unique about the engineering school is um, we're the only school at the university that we don't offer a significant number of, of courses over the summer. And so, and the reason for that is we want our students to kind of, you know, so we're on the quarter system. So this is going to be a big difference when you start looking at different colleges and making those final hard decisions on where you'd like to apply or where you, once you get in, like what schools you're going to going to accept or what school, sorry, just one that you want to accept the offer from, um, is looking at the school's academic calendar because that that's going to be, you know, that's substantially um, a, a very different feel. So we are not a semester school. We are a quarter school. School. And so what that means for our students is that we have three quarters in one academic year. And so um, our academic year is roughly nine months. Um, so for summer session, after nine months of education and engineering, we want you, our expectation is that you'll take that knowledge that you obtained and you're going to put it into practice. So you're going to demonstrate it in a real life setting. Um, and our students then will either do that with internships, co-ops, um, as well as our, our research or, or research experiences. We do have research opportunities that students, and those are, the students can apply for a grant. So those are paid opportunities over the summer um, and during the academic year, to be honest, but most of our undergrads will do it over the summer. Um, and the grant that you um, submit to, there's different, um, or, or different departments that you can apply for funding and so for all Northwestern students they can go through the undergraduate research office and then for engineering students they can also go through that office or they can choose to go and apply for a grant through the engineering school because we're really lucky um, that we do have undergraduate grants that are available for students. Um, our freshmen or first year students um, do not participate, like they can apply for a grant. There's special grant funding in the engineering school that's targeted only for first year or second year students. Um, and the reason for that is we want to make sure that you have those opportunities. Because research for most of our students, if not all, is going to be a completely new opportunity. Um, and we don't want a first year student competing against a student who's, you know, an upperclassman who's had three or four years. For or three years perhaps of, of experience kind of building and growing their knowledge. Um, we want to make sure that um, all students kind of have equal access to those opportunities. So the funding sources are a little bit different, um, which is, I think, kind of a positive, to be quite honest. Um, we also have research opportunities. Some of our engineering students, you probably notice that there's a lot of overlap, especially with, um, in, uh, with the medical industry. And so we do have at Northwestern, we're lucky we have a Strive Medical School who's on our Chicago campus. And so students, um, if they have an interest in maybe thinking about medical school or working with medical devices or um, going into pharmaceuticals, um, they might also try to get a, a research opportunity, not just at the engineering school, but also explore opportunities at the med school. We have a shuttle that connects the two campuses that's only open to Northwestern students, faculty, and staff. That shuttle runs uh, five days a week during the, the work week, um, and so students can pursue opportunities um, and have the transportation that's available to them at no cost, um, too, which is kind of nice. All of your courses, though, are going to be on the main campus, which is in the city of Evanston, um, and um, that's that's where we're housed. Um, cool. Um, do you guys have any questions over anything so far? Sounding okay? All right, awesome. Um, the other thing I just want to talk about, and this is where I kind of get super excited, so I'm going to try to keep it concise because um, I've been told mostly by my younger siblings that I can go on forever about this, but I think it's cool. I'll be quite honest. So where you kind of are going to see really big differences too among engineering curriculums are, uh, or engineering schools are in how we handle our first year curriculum. Um, and it's actually really, really good that we're different. Um, the cornerstone of our program, though, is focused in design. And design engineering is something we start in your first quarter. And then we build upon that um, as you continue your career here at Northwestern. So all of our first year students take, a, they take two courses. That are like the umbrella courses. Um, and the phrase that we use is engineering first. So everyone's going to take the engineering first program. So regardless of where you are with AP, um, regardless if you're undecided with your major or you know since you were like four that you want to do biomedical engineering, doesn't matter. Like everyone does this. So the first class you're going to take is called engineering analysis. Its acronym is EA. You're going to find in engineering that we love acronyms. And so EA is a four-quarter sequential course that you start fall quarter freshman year taught by actual engineering faculty. So the concept behind the EA course sequence is that students um, 
have hands-on opportunities to kind of learn about the different areas of engineering that we offer. We know from talking with students that there's not a lot of great PR about what engineering is at the junior high or high school level. Reality is a lot of our students, vast majority, fall into engineering totally by accident. They're told by a parent, they're told by a teacher, hey, you seem to have really good math skills, um, you seem to enjoy science, you seem to really hate English or history, and then they'll list a whole bunch of humanities. <laughs> um, we don't actually care what got you here. We're just absolutely thrilled that you want to give it a shot because we really do believe, I promise you, at the end of the day of just four years of education, you're going to have a skill set as an engineer to go out and to positively impact the world and make it a much better place. Um, we really believe that it's, you know, our EA sequence allows our students through hands-on opportunities to really kind of see the power of the profession they're about to pursue. Every single industry uh, faces problems, right? The world has a ton of problems. Obviously, we're on Zoom right now. Um, and engineers are going to be the people that go out and they're going to make solutions um, to the challenges that everybody is currently facing. Um, so we get, I get super excited about what your, your, the interest that you have and the opportunities you're going to have available to you. And what we want to do is we want to get that excitement to our students. Um, so the second class that you'll take, and what we've noticed too, just so you know, for the EA sequence, is that not only do students declare their majors much earlier in their academic career, but more importantly, they report a higher rate of satisfaction with the major that you've actually selected. And so as an administrator, as an advisor, that's an awesome trend that we want to see continuing. So we're really proud about that. Um, and then the second class that you have to take is called uh, Design Thinking and Communication. Its acronym is DTC. It's a two-quarter class um, that typically our first-year students have the option to take the first section either fall or winter, and then the second section is done um, during spring quarter of your, your freshman year. Um, what's nice about that class is it's going to be your first exposure to design engineering. Uh, it's team-taught, team-based, and team-led. And so what that means is that we, the engineering school, are going to find an outside client for each of our student teams. That outside client is going to have an engineering-related project, um, but not necessarily have the resources to hire a licensed team to solve that problem. Um, and so we use our students to get this opportunity. Um, we work a lot with nonprofit organizations um, in the area. And so you'll have real people, real clients that you'll be in communication with as a team. You'll be placed on a team with three of your peers. So it also allows you to really kind of hone those communication skills um, right from the start. Um, we, um, you'll have two instructors for that class, too. You're going to have one from the engineering school who's going to help you through the whole design process. The second instructor is going to come from the School of Communications. Um, the reason for that is sometimes when you ask people, hey, what's the most negative stereotype that you have heard about engineers that typically has stayed with engineers from generation to generation? It's typically, man, those people. People can't talk. <laughs> the reality is, in order to be a successful engineer, you have to have really good communication skills. You have to be able to ask questions. You have to be able to demonstrate that you're listening um, so that you can identify what the actual problem is that you're trying to work on. Um, and so we work really closely with faculty in the School of Communications to kind of hone those skills right from the start. Um, I know from talking with a lot of our first year students uh, or prospective students, when they start to hear like team projects, like they remember what that team project was like in high school. Most of the students that, if not all of the students that we have, are the tops. They're, they've worked, you know, they've come and they've had a lot of success at the high school level. And so typically when they hear a team project, they think about like, wow, that means I'm going to have to carry three other people like I have in high school for the last four years. No. The nice thing about it is the, the team members that you have, um, they're all super they're all super accomplished as well as you are. And so what our teams can actually accomplish is rather significant. Um, so it's something that I get I get pretty excited about. Um, I did notice uh, another uh, chat question. Uh, would you say that engineering classes are more project based, theoretical or a mix of both? Great question, Philip. Um, they're definitely a mix. Um, so it is important for you to have a theoretical base um, for some of your core classes. So you're going to have more theory classes, um, I'd say your freshman and sophomore year, for sure. Um, and then what you'll start to see is, like, you'll always have a, um, so 
I'm trying to get ahead of myself, I guess, or, or not get ahead of myself, sorry. Um, so I'm a big believer. I'm an advisor for undecided students. So I work with our sophomores who are still trying to figure out what major is that makes the most sense for them. And so my philosophy as an advisor is I believe in successful scheduling. And so most of our engineering students will take four classes a quarter. And so what, we, what I want to do when I work with my students is to kind of talk about the classes they're considering and then like look at what the load is, the workload's going to be like, so that they can get something that's going to be pretty balanced. Um, so your first and second year, you're going to probably have usually um, three engineering classes. And then the fourth class is going to be something that's either going to be more of a design-focused class, so hands-on, or it's going to be something outside of engineering. Because you may have seen in um, admissions has it all over, if, or if we've already started to send you brochures or um, emails, the phrase whole brain engineering. Um, whole brain engineering is what we use to describe our curriculum. So our philosophy is that we want to produce engineers that are going to change the world. And so as an engineer, it's important for you to have opportunities to build up both sides of your brain, both the right and the left side. And so we want to make sure that you have class opportunities, you have opportunities to take classes that are going to allow you to be successful in that endeavor. And so you have to, as an engineer from Northwestern, take a minimum of 20% of your classes outside the engineering school. If you use your unrestrictive electives, you can take up to 30% of your classes outside of the engineering school. Um, so it's not uncommon for our students to have um, coursework or to even sometimes pursue a minor outside of engineering. And usually what our students will do is like, I mean, definitely we have some students that will do a minor, maybe an econ, um, which probably wouldn't be a huge surprise for an engineer. Um, but we have a fair amount of students that also will maybe do mechanical engineering and then pursue a minor in dance or maybe a minor in theater. Um, or music. Um, that's something that I think really speaks to the type of engineer we attract because in order to be an engineer, you're gonna, your biggest thing is being able to problem solve efficiently for people and that takes a lot of creativity. And so we want to make sure that you have opportunities in your courses to have classes that you're taking that helps to foster a strong sense of creativity. Um, and just, it helps you to kind of look at problems from a number of different perspectives, um, which is really important, right? Like you're going to have a lot of stakeholders that you'll be dealing with when you're solving problems. So it's important for you to be able to kind of see maybe different things that they're going to take under consideration that might be different from your own perspective. Um, but I definitely would say that our classes are, um, as you kind of continue in your getting closer to graduation, you will see more hands-on um, and more projects. Like all of our students do a two-quarter um, capstone, senior capstone project that, that's usually team-based as well. Um, there's opportunity depending on what your area of interest is. Um, some of our projects are actually international um, because engineering is a global profession. There's problems all over the world, not just in the States. Um, but if you do choose to come to Northwestern, I, I feel very comfortable saying there will be an expectation that you will get your hands dirty. Whether you choose to do it just on U.S. soil or you choose to go abroad to do it, that's your decision. Um, but definitely we have students that work um, closely um, with uh, uh, clients around the world. Um, is it rare for someone to double major? I'm going to say yes. Um, we definitely have students, and that's a very common thing that people want to do their freshman year, and um, I'll, I try to talk them out of it. <laughs> and the reason for that is I don't think you, I mean, it depends what your end goal is, right? And so I want to know what, I want it to be a conversation with the students I work with, um, but I don't always think it's necessary um, because, you know, choosing, choosing one engineering major is a lot. And that, I think, is more than enough for most of our students. Um, what we do tend to see, though, is students now that are doing, we have a, a program, that, and this might be something that you might be interested in, um, it's a, it's a um, BSMS program. And so it's a, it allows our students to get a bachelor's and a master's in engineering a little bit more efficiently, maybe. Um, the, and so how the, our program works is it's an accelerated program so that if you are th about three quarters away from graduating with your bachelor's degree and um, you have a 3.5 GPA cumulative or higher, you are automatically accepted into any of the master's programs within the engineering school. Um, you don't need to take the GRE, the graduate records examination. Um, you don't need to, um, um, you don't, 
Yeah, it's, it's actually, you write a, um, you need to have two advisors who, or two recommendation letters, usually one's from your advisor, maybe one's from an instructor who supports it, but you're automatically accepted. If your GPA is a little bit below that, if it's a 3.0 to a 3.49, you're still eligible for the accelerated application, so you don't have to take the GRE, um, and it's um, just not automatic acceptance. You do have to do, you have the two rec letters, um, but then you also have a personal statement, which is just two paragraphs of why this is a good opportunity or why you think this is, you need this master's or it's a, it, how it in line, aligns with your goals, essentially. Um, and it's also what I think is kind of neat is that it doesn't have to be in the same area that your bachelor's is in. So what I love about engineering is that you can approach it um, sometimes the same projects from so many different backgrounds, right? So maybe you're interested in robotics. Well, you could have a really successful career um, in robotics um, with maybe a bachelor's degree in computer science and a master's in mechanical engineering or a master's in, or a bachelor's in material science and a bachelor or a master's in um, computer engineering. So there's a lot of different majors that you can pursue to work in an industry uh, just because there's so much overlap with the information that um, you have access to. So um, that's something that I do think is pretty cool um, because we do see so many students sometimes coming in and they've had some great opportunities to really get some significant AP credits or IB credits. The BSMS program is also something that students can do in maybe four years. Um, that's harder, I'll be honest, but like usually it's four years, maybe one or two quarters. Um, and then you're graduating with two degrees at two different levels. Um, that I think is more worth the effort than doing two bachelor's degrees at the same level, even though they're in different concentrations as far as majors. So, um, but it really does depend on what the individual's goals are. So that would be something that you would talk with more about your your advice with your advisor. Um, do engineering studies to study abroad and stay and still stay on target for four year graduation? Yeah, we are really pushing to get more of our engineering students to do study abroad. So right now it's about forty percent. Um, so that's the lowest of all the schools at Northwestern. Um, I did not do study abroad when I was in college. It's still one of my biggest regrets. Um, it's definitely something you can do and you can graduate um, in four years. The biggest thing is that um, there's just two caveats to that or two <laughs> asterisks. One is, it depending on what your major is and what your language proficiency is of the country you're choosing to study in, it can be hard to do a full year abroad. So the full year abroad can be a little, that definitely can be challenging um, because there are certain majors that, you know, Every, like you all take thermodynamics and thermodynamics if you're you know if you're a, if you're a study abroad in Germany and you're a non-native German speaker that's going to be tough right and so but doing the full doing six months abroad I feel very comfortable saying 100% that is something you can do and still be able to graduate um, it, and on time in four years as an engineering student you can also do I know you didn't ask this but you can also do you can do study abroad and do um, the co-op program because for co-op it's a you're going to take 12 quarters of classes and those 12 quarters of classes don't all have to be on northwestern's campus um, to be quite honest so you could do one of those internationally what we usually do with students that are thinking about study abroad is um, in our orientation <laughs> when um, so all of our first year students come before the rest of the students come to campus and we talk about getting them ready you know you register for your classes you'll meet with your advisor um, you do orientation activities but you also we talk start talking to you about study abroad um, it's not it's never too early to start talking with your advisor or indicate your interest in study abroad um, you can always change your mind most of our students will do study abroad there um, junior year, usually it's fall quarter. Um, most of our uh, international schools are on the semester system, so their calendar year is going to be a little bit different than ours. So usually our students, if they're doing a fall semester abroad, um, they're going to leave to go abroad in July. And so they'll be gone usually like uh, the first week in July they'll go. And then they don't come back to us, to Northwestern, until winter quarter, which is in January. Um, so that gives you a pretty extensive period to be overseas. 
um, and to, to be, you know, doing a, a traditional study abroad program. Um, another plug I just thought of this, though, too, is if for international opportunities, another way to have an international opportunity if you didn't want to commit a full quarter abroad um, is to look at some of our student organizations. And I'd actually, I know a lot of our peer schools um, also probably have very similar opportunities, too. Like, so, for example, we have a chapter of Engineers for a Sustainable World. Um, they do a lot with um, uh, working on clean drink, drinking water, bringing drink, clean drinking water to different communities. Um, and then we also have a chapter of Engineers Without Borders. Um, and so there's a lot of different opportunities. So for students, if they don't necessarily want to do a full fall quarter abroad, so they'll go, we usually send students for 10 days over winter break, um, over 10 days over spring break, and then over the summer, we have students that will go anywhere from four to 12 weeks um, overseas uh, to work on those design projects in country. Cool, this is great, guys. Um, any other questions that you have about, and I apologize because we're supposed to end at 4.30 and I always go over though. Uh, do you have any other questions about something that you're just interested in learning more about what it would be like experience-wise at Northwestern in McCormick? Zoe? Um, yeah, you might have already said this, but um, okay. what's the gender breakdown in the engineering school? Oh, great question. I did not. I skipped it. Sorry. Um, so we're 40% female, um, which is still too low, <laughs> personally. Um, and um, But I will say this, too. The one thing I have been really proud of, because one of the things I do look at is retention. And um, our retention for female students is actually, and this has been true for the last six years, is actually higher than that of our male students. Um, and I'm really, really proud of that. So retention for female students is 93%. 93% of our women who will start our program will graduate with an engineering degree. And that's something that um, I'm very proud of. Um, and a lot of my, my peers are too, my colleagues at the school. Um, our retention for men is actually high too for an engineering school as well. It's 87%. Um, so 87% of our men who start will walk across that stage and um, pick up an engineering degree. I think one of the reasons why we are so high, though, retention-wise, um, is it's a priority, obviously, of the school, but also I think it's the design approach. Um, and your classes are going to be smaller. We're, we're actually, I mean, we are a smaller engineering school size-wise. Um, you know, yes, we're in the Big Ten. Um, we're in the, but we're really the, the baby of the Big Ten in terms of numbers, and everyone's scared to death for tomorrow when we play Ohio State. Like, <laughs> this is not going to go pretty for us. We know that. Uh, but we have a good band, although I don't think they're going to be there. Um, and so it's, um, so, but, so what happens is that I do think that it's our culture because of our size, though, is if somebody, you know, if somebody's running into a problem or if a professor notices that somebody's not turning in homework or they're not showing up or they're they're not doing well on their exams they the faculty member will reach out either to myself or to my other my colleague the other assistant dean and then we follow up with the student and i think our, that is a strength for us it allows us to identify issues or challenges that our, our students are experiencing very early on in their careers um, so that we can get a solution as quickly as possible um, we're very big on um, you know, I think our students have a lot of access to the administration, and I, when I compare it to my own experience, but mine was at very big state schools, um, I didn't even know somebody had a job like mine when I was in college. And so it's, um, so I think the size is something that um, is, is a benefit for us. And, but I also think it really relays into why our retention is so high. And I do think, like, there is a lot of misconceptions about what engineering is, um, and that's something that is is um, that we're able to kind of address in the DTC class because I think that it's, I mean, I don't know, if I was in charge of the world, which I'm not, I would make every undergrad do engineering because it's such a problem-based solving approach to, in, in any industry, any job you go into, you're going to have problems and you're going to face really tough, you have to make tough decisions. And if you're just feel a little bit more comfortable making those decisions using data to support it, um, and you just, it teaches your brain to think a little bit differently. And so you just become, I think, a much better or more efficient problem solver. And every industry needs someone like that. So, so that's a really long-winded question, so I apologize for that. Um, how diverse is the student base in engineering? Um, 
We're, we're definitely working on that. Um, so we're about 12% uh, of our, our undergrads are international students. Uh, we do pull students from all different states in the United States. Um, I don't remember the total number of countries, but admissions will have this. And if I can, if you follow, so shoot me an email, I can follow up with you to give you specifics. Um, and then 14% uh, of our students uh, classify themselves as underrepresented um, from a demographic group. Um, really interested in the master's in robotics, yeah. Do students do any specific undergrad courses to prepare for this master's? Um, so typically students that go into the um, robotics program, they and this is just typically, they'll major in mechanical engineering as their undergraduate degree or electrical engineering is what we tend to see. Um, and then we do have a robotics club. And so our students, you know, the student organizations, and that's also something I work with, um, that I think is really, really important um, as a way to kind of continue your education outside of the classroom. Um, and also too, and this would be true, this is something I didn't realize when I was in college. Um, college, one of the things you kind of want to do in college too is look at networking and starting to build your network um, professionally as early as possible. And a way to do that is with student groups, student organizations. And this is not unique to Northwestern. This is true for all engineering schools. Um, a lot of our engineering schools, you get industry support from companies that want to hire and they want to meet the students who are on like the NU solar car or the formula racing team um, and the robotics club. And so, and the reason for that is because Getting involved in a student organization allows you to definitely continue to build those skills outside of the classroom, but also, too, it allows you to meet people, and it shows that you take initiative and that you put yourself out there and you, you want to get involved and you really want to, you know, develop your leadership skills. And so, you know, that's something, too, that I would say um, can be really, really helpful. Um, I'm, I don't want to... Um, I see a hands raised, but like it's not giving me the name. Hold on. My okay, it was me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, like going back to the women in engineering topic, like are there any student organizations specifically which are for the support system in women in engineering, like in addition to the yeah. administration yeah. being helpful? Yeah, so we would call them affinity groups. Yes, definitely. And so we have a chapter of, um, it's a national, these are national organizations. Um, well, all of them except one is, but um, the one that is not is called Women in Computing. And so it's um, kind of targeted a little bit more for uh, our female students who are thinking about computer science, computer engineering, or electrical engineering. Um, and that's, uh, that's unique to Northwestern. Um, and then um, national groups though, we have Society of Women Engineers, uh, we also have um, uh, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, National Society of Black Engineers, and um, our last affinity group is um, Socia um, Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. And all of the organizations run their own um, uh, mentoring programs, and, and they have specialized tutoring, too, to just help with involvement, and then also outreach. Outreach is another really big way that we get people excited. Um, let's see. Oh, I, sorry. I see that the chat. Okay, sorry. I think I skipped one. Oh, you're deciding between two fields, um, either pre-med track under biology or an engineering major. So if I decide to switch majors, would that be possible for me? Definitely possible switch majors. We don't, even within the engineering school, declaring your major, we don't cap our major. So it's very fluid movement to, to change your major. Um, at larger schools, um, they kind of, it's a space constraint issue. And so sometimes if you, you know, if you start out in one field and you realize, well, this is not what I thought biomedical engineering was, I think I actually want to do chemical engineering. Um, if they don't have a spot open for you, sometimes it can delay access to those classes in that major, which could potentially delay graduation. It's not like that here. It's literally a half sheet of paper that you fill out if you want to change your major and you're automatically in that new department and you get automatically get a new faculty advisor assigned to you. Um, to switch from Weinberg or to the McCormick School, either way around, yeah. We, we call them at Northwestern Interschool Transfers. Um, so it's 
Um, it's important to have a, a cumulative GPA of a 2.0 or higher um, to do an inner school transfer. Um, and that's, um, but yeah, it's there. If, as long as you hit that threshold, you should be fine with that. Um, I'm biased, so I'm going to tell you to start off in engineering first, <laughs> um, especially for pre med. Um, so for pre med, obviously, and I'll give you my reasonings really quickly. Um, for pre-med, you're going to have special classes that you need to take to be eligible to apply for medical school. If you major in biomedical engineering or chemical engineering, the classes that you need to take to make you eligible for medical school are already part of our curriculum for biomedical engineering and for chemical engineering. Medical school is going to be competitive, right? Um, it's super, super, unfortunately, important for that for students who um, you have to do something to kind of set your application apart from the others when you're applying for medical school, right? Coming in with an engineering degree is going to give you that difference. I, and it's the other part, too, is like, and you know, I kind of said this earlier, but like it's all about problem solving. And so your brain will be taught to think a little differently having that engineering background. It's a technical background. Um, and all that means is that you're going to have the science knowledge that you need to be a successful physician, but you're going to have that technical piece, which is just application. So it's how do I use this information to solve this problem? And what are you going to face every day as a doctor, though? People who have a lot of serious problems, and they're going to want a solution as quick as possible. And if your brain is wired a little differently to approach a problem in a different manner and to get a solution a little quicker that's also reliable because you're using data to support those decisions, you're going to be a super popular doctor. Um, you also don't have as much grade GPA pressure having the engineering degree as opposed to having the pure science background for medical school. So when you hear older students or college students, if you know some now that are pre-med and they talk about like the GPA pressure is real, it's terrible, it's the most stressful thing I've ever experienced. Unfortunately, that's true for students who are thinking about medical school and are coming from a science uh, background. It's, it's intense. Um, it's not that your GPA isn't important in engineering, it is, um, but it gives you, um, you have a little bit of a buffer with it. Um, it's from something that I've not only heard, but I've also seen with students. Um, is it easy uh, to join research clubs like the NU Solar, Solar Car? Oh, no problems with the type. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, some of the clubs at Northwestern outside of the engineering school do have applications and they have auditions. And so unfortunately, not everyone who wants to be a member gets in. Not in engineering, we'll take anyone, <laughs> and it's our size. Um, we need people, we need really talented people um, to do our organizations. And the, the reality, too, in engineering is like, you know, you can't join every group, though, um, because your time is going to be limited. Um, you're going to have to make some tough decisions. Your social life is going to look a little different than somebody who's not pursuing engineering, and that's, that's true. Um, but you got to remember, if you come here, you're going to Northwestern. Like, we're not known for our parties <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, um, you know, you'll you'll still be able to have a, like, we want you to sleep, we want you to have a social life, but you got to have balance, right? So you're going to have to limit which groups that you become uh, extremely active in. Um, but definitely, you can, we have, we want you to be in charge or, or be involved in our organizations. Um, is it somewhat, is it possible for someone to join research in their freshman year? Definitely. <laughs> um, so again, it's our size, which I think gives us the advantage. We are an R1 school, um, which is research one. So research is is um, is very valued, and it's it's taking place a lot on our campus. Um, and so it's important for um, our students to have access to those opportunities. And the reality is that. Um, we don't have as many bodies to fill those positions. And so as a result, um, engi research engineering or engineering research opportunities fall to our first and second year students. Um, and so for some students, if they uh, apply for financial aid and they receive work study, um, you can do it as a work study job and get paid for that experience. Um, for students who don't have work study, they can apply for an academic grant during the academic year. Um, so that they could get paid for that. And then we also have students that volunteer their time to get involved in research. Um, but research is something that we're, we're really excited about, our faculty are excited about, um, and we want our students to get excited about. And I would even go so far to say, like, when you're, you know, if we make your top list of, and you apply, 
and you're admitted and you want to come, but you're you know, still deciding between those other schools that you're considering, don't hesitate. For us, our culture is that you know, all of our faculty have their, on the website, the department page, they have the, the research areas that they're, they work in, and go it, look at it. And if something sounds interesting to you, don't hesitate to reach out to that faculty member. Their email is going to be there. And just introduce yourself like, hey, I'm a, you know, a recently admitted student, and I'm interested in your research that you do. How many undergrads work in your lab? And that gives you some idea as far as how accessible it can be. Because um, I do think those are important decisions if you know that's something that's important for you um, as you start college. Cool. So I know I'm talking a lot, and I, I do tend to talk fast because I want to get as much in as possible. Um, is there, I'm going to do a last call for any, any other questions that you guys have? Cool. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, like, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I know everyone is probably so zoomed out and your classes, if you're remote for high school, are probably coming to an end. Um, and so we really, we really appreciate you spending time here um, in my dining room. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we know you have a lot of choices out there and it's, it's, it's hard to kind of figure out what school makes the most sense. If there is anything that I can do, do not hesitate to, to reach out to me. Um, I do work even in the remote setting uh, with a number of our undergraduate students. Um, they are probably the best people to kind of get a perspective of. And so if you, you know, if we're making your short list and you want to talk to an undergrad or you're just curious about what, you know, what study abroad programs, um, maybe you, you know already that you want to go to Argentina and you want to talk to a, one of our engineering students to see if they were able to accomplish that, um, I can, let me know. Like, don't hesitate to, to reach out. I can, and give me parameters, and I can work to match you with somebody who can kind of speak to that experience. Um, because I know our students, they have a lot of pride in the school, but they also, you know, they were a prospective student at one point too, and they, they, they want students who choose to come to Northwestern to have that same sense of pride that they had um, coming in. And so they'll be brutally honest like any good undergrad should be, right? Um, so good luck for you guys. Um, hope you have a great holiday season, um, and um, thanks. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's super I'm so helpful. sorry for like moving around. I was oh, no, no. trying to find good lighting, but it was so bad. Yeah. No, no, you're totally fine. You're totally fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just had a question about oh, sure. research. So, um, are, is, like, I know you mentioned some overlap with the medical school, but is interdisciplinary research like something common within the engineering school? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. It's. Uh, do you have an idea what areas you might be thinking about? So, like, some of the things I'm pretty passionate about are like human-centric engineering research. So, like ethics and AI, or something around like even biomedical engineering. Yeah. I know that isn't more in the engineering school, but something yeah. about like the ethical concerns surrounding. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. There's so at the medical school there's. A, the, there's the, the Center for Bioethics, <laughs> and so, and also too, we offer undergraduate classes in there, um, in that area, and so that could be something that you do, maybe even for your, like, we call it a theme, so your humanities classes, there, there has to be, you, you have to take a minimum of seven humanities, but three of them have to be somehow thematically related, but you choose what that theme is. Um, so you could do like a bioethics theme, and then that would give you some of the undergraduate courses to take. Um, but at the medical school, for sure, we have research in that area, um, and that especially with genetics um, or stem cells. And so, like there, there might be opportunities there that you become really interested in. But for sure, that you would have opportunity with that. Okay, thank you. And then, like specifically for like ethics surrounding robots or artificial intelligence. Oh yeah, AI. Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, great. That's so nice to hear. Cool. <laughs> um, I had a question. Yeah. So I was just wondering, um, for the Ford Design Center, do yeah. um, first year students have access to it? Yeah. So that, like, so, right, yes, is the short answer. Right now, eh, not so much. <laughs> um, but that's because we're remote. 
Um, but like we do plan on all of the first year students coming, everybody like campus is open for winter quarter. So in January, everybody that wants to come back can come back. Um, the DTC class, the design thinking and communication class is housed in Ford. And so as a, as a first year student, you take that class in winter or fall, or I'm sorry, fall or winter of your freshman year, you take the first section, and then all first year students take the second section during the spring. And so you'll get a student ID, we call it a wild card. Your wild card gives you 24 seven hour access to it. You'll go through required shop training when you do Ford. And, um, and so that once you complete your shop training, that gives you access to the building. And then if you have your own projects that you become interested in, you have that shop training, so then you safely know how to use the machines, and so you would continue to keep that access. But we don't really close off. Um, <laughs> and if there's not a pandemic, <laughs> then everything is, is it's a pretty open campus. So yeah, you would definitely, it's our design hub. And then also too, depending on what your major might be, if you become interested, um, or you decide you want to pursue a design certificate, um, then you would be, that's where your classes are going to take place in Ford. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and it, that's kind of also where we have our, um, like our maker space is also in Ford too, and all Northwestern students have access to that. Um, although I'll be honest, it's mostly the engineering students, students who utilize it. Okay, awesome. Cool. Yep.